Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to number 21, I think, in the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about it's broke, now what? Um, basically, troubleshooting tips, things to uh, help you get through the stuff that isn't doing what it's doing now. And this is something I vaguely remember from way back in the field service days, but to uh, make the job a little easier, we bring somebody in with some fresh experience. We've got Adam Middlecoop from Nautel's own service department. Adam, welcome, and thanks for being with us today. Oh, happy to be invited back. Oh, good to have you. You didn't uh, you didn't scare us away too badly last time, so always good to have a repeat. Uh, we've I'll, also I'll got Shane. <laughs> we've got Shane Tobin from um, EMF and Caleb. Uh, Shane, welcome back. Good to have you here again. Well, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, Shane has got the unique experience of both being the guy that has to fix the stuff when it breaks now as well as you uh, at one point in your checkered past uh, were a factory uh, support tech as well weren't you i have i've seen this industry from uh, from several facets now so obviously as a customer um briefly as a uh, trade journalist and uh, also for a, uh, for at least a good several years or so three four years as um as technical support um once for uh, i was uh, with enco systems for a year and then i spent uh, about three years with uh, with telos so uh, working for uh, uh, doing linear uh, support for the linear acoustic line of uh, products for them. So. so you've done it from pretty much every end of the telephone and in the middle somewhere. So thank you for that. Uh, last but not least, very much not least, and you don't see a picture on the screen, Mr. Disembodied Voice himself, Edward Sylvester. Ed, thanks for all you do to get this stuff going and to uh, herd the cats. We really do appreciate it. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Ed, Oh, there he is. See, this is why we call him Mr. Disembodied Voice. It does have a title slide in here somewhere. We took it off the main screen, and the only mission you guys have is to hang tight till you see it. Whoever tells me in the uh, question box who Ed picture is, because it won't be Ed, then uh, we'll send you a swag kit. On that note, if you look at your little control panel, you'll see a place where you can enter a question. You can type your question in, you can uh, hit the little hand wavy icon there, raise your hand. Uh, definitely, we're gonna want a lot of input on this one because we are talking about troubleshooting and ideas and tools and the various things and resources we use to get the job done. So this is where you folks, your input is gonna be crucial. This is also why I've got Shane and Adam, people smarter than me. Like I said last week, it's easier for me if I get you guys to do all the real work and I just sit here and I can't say look pretty because that, that ship has sailed, but, uh, but we'll have some fun anyway. Also, if you're an SBE member, uh, remember that this does qualify you for half a recertification credit under category I of the recertification schedule. Go to the shiny new SBE website. Uh, there is a little chart that you can uh, sort of, I think it's a chart, I don't remember now, but uh, just keep track of your uh, your sessions for things like that. Oh, see Shane, um, I'm not the only one. So we were rehearsing yesterday, a little side note, and uh, Shane, uh, I looked at him and said, what happened to your chin? Because all the pictures you see on Facebook, of course, these days, everybody's got a mask on. And I remember Shane had some, some chin whiskers. And it's been a while, right? I did. Yeah, it's it's been a while. But I finally decided to, uh, you know, to go bare and uh, get rid of the uh, the fuzz. And and see, uh, John, John Van Milligan mentioned with uh, me with my preparation for winter growth and Adam's got the Grizzly Adams look going on there too that uh, <laughs> you're, you're kind of mismatched there in this one. Yeah, but, maybe uh, I'll get back to it eventually. <laughs> there you go. There you go. The great thing about uh, this uh, social isolation thing is except for the fact that I've got a camera on me more than usual, I can get away with letting it grow out a little bit. All right, um, the usual agenda slide, we'll skip that one, and ideas for things to discuss. So these are the kind of things we're gonna talk about. Uh, how do you figure out what's wrong? Where do you look? How do you uh, get the fastest responses from the folks on the other end of the phone? Maybe Adam will give us a few tips there. I, I know I stole one of his slides from an earlier presentation, and that sort of thing. So 
let's get right into it. And Adam, I'm going to let you hit me with this. Uh, really, when you look at one of our boxes, there's three main ways of telling where where to look, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, so looks like we got, yes, yeah, so we've got a log screen. Um, that's useful for telling you what has happened. Um, won't tell you so much what's going on now, but if things were weird and you get there, you can get some clues from that screen for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so you got the graphical interface and you've got it also from the, the front panel view, like on some of the small NX, the VS or the NV lights, um, or the, the bottom screen on a GV actually. And then considerably less useful are the four LEDs on the right there, exciter, power amplifier, output network, power supply. Um, VS in particular, these serve almost no purpose. They're a holdover from, you go back to you know, V and Q and the old amp fed FMs when all you had was you know two meters um, and then some test points. So yeah, something in the exciter area was, was wrong and you'd have to check your five te test points, see what's up and carry on. Now the transmitters tell you in words what's wrong, so these don't really help you all that much. And on VS in particular, there's only one board that generates any alarm, and that's the exciter. So yeah. the, the whole range of alarms from you're not connected to a network to you are burning down right now um, will make that exciter light change color. So um, yeah. they're a good, quick, go, no-go indicator, but always jump in, um, view the status, view the alarms, um, check your logs. It, it tells you in words what's wrong, and you can get a lot just from looking at it. So, Adam, speaking of that, uh, I actually, uh, that's one of the common calls I get from our uh, our field engineers here at EMF or, or from the shop. Sometimes they'll see that exciter light uh, blinking, even though the transmitter appears to be operating normally, and they're wondering what the heck is going on. Well, that's its way of telling you, hey, I've got no network connection. As you can see on the log here, it says host network down. Uh, so even if everything is normal, uh, sometimes you'll still get one of those lights on the front panel that uh, that is doing something. Yeah, and that's that's where just the extra two button clicks it lets you know right away. Okay, I don't need to care about this. I've had so many people call me and they're like, "Yeah, I got a red exciter light." Okay, cool. Check the alarms. Oh, I can't do that. Well, why not? Oh, I I drove home. Okay. And then, it's, but it's three hours back to the site. Uh, okay. So you're you're somewhere between no internet connection and on fire so yeah. I, I can't help you narrow it down any more than that so it's and uh, that's one of the things that uh and it, it really i mean of course i put uh, our transmitters up here well two two pictures from the handbook and then the logs are from my own transmitter at uh, cove fm and uh, that uh, host network down was the result of us literally shutting the transmitter off to do a uh, replace the front panel display so all the alarms are cleared now and it's looking very happy but well, uh, that's a, yeah, that's just it. yeah, that's another thing that I've run across from time to time. I'll get calls from uh, from again our our field engineers sometimes, or somebody who is not quite as familiar with the VS uh, series or any of these transmitters. They'll see a whole bunch of alarms logged in the log, um, but really there's nothing wrong. All they've done is you know turned it off or turned it back on, or there's been a power twitch or something like that. And of course the transmitter is going to freak out, especially if you have a UPS on the controller. The transmitter is going to go. I don't know what's happening here. I see all of these issues. Now it's up to you to figure out what that issue really is. And when it's really bonkers like that, sometimes it's just something as simple as it was a power twitch. Yep. Yeah, and like I'll always tell people, like be careful with the logs, be careful with the meters. You can drive yourself crazy doing it. Um, the NX is a, is a really, uh, I guess, bad one for that, if you will. Because even a, even a 25 kilowatt NX is, has 20 power modules. So you have 20 individual sets of meters, 20 individual brains that are gonna pay attention to what's going on. So if you have just a normal shutback, you know, a branch goes across, spark gaps or whatever happens, um, you potentially have 20 modules saying, hey, what's going on? And then they say, oh, never mind, I know what's going on. So you've got 40, 50 log entries from one single event. So I just tell people, take, take a step back, you know, look at the whole thing, find the entire window, and then you'll see, oh, shut back. Yeah, there you go. The rest yeah. is all just. Yep. And that includes if you see a whole bunch of stuff happen all at once, then usually it was some other outside event. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something that's that's wrong. Right. And as a rule, the first one or two events are going to be the actual cause of all the other incidental stuff. And that's probably the, the biggest thing I tell folks is, is, is like Adam said, go back to the beginning of that group of events and, and figure out what happened first. You know, because if I see an SWR cutback followed by an SWR foldback followed by high R or power, very low power, et cetera, and so on, 
then yeah, something happened in the antenna system. That's all I need to know. So that, that's a, a really good point there. And really, like I said, I've shown our gear in this one, of course, because it's what we've got to work with and have the most access to, but almost anything will have multiple levels of alarms. And like those little lights, like Adam said, they're, they're like the engine light in your car. They tell you something sideways, but it could be anything from you don't have a network connection to, um, yeah, they're, we're burning down here. Um, so it's good to learn, you know, like we do red or orange or flashing. So learn the statuses for whatever pieces of equipment you maintain and how they, uh, how they um, really work with that. And like ours, you know, we've got red for this is bad to green for, okay, it's gone away. It's all good now. So, I don't, I don't think I've ever walked into a facility and not seen uh, in various types of facilities too, transmitter, data centers, whatever, not seen some sort of alarm light on something, uh, either mm -hmm. active or logged. And uh, yeah, it's just, just a matter of going through those logs and figuring out what happened and if it's something you really need to do anything about, or if it's just reset right. it and walk away. Yeah. And Adam, you made another really good point and we're going to touch on that in a moment. So I'll hold on to it, but uh, just keep the uh, whole um, three hours away from the sight line in the back of your mind. Um, now, the other thing is, is RTFM. I mean, you know, the, there was somebody was uh, making the joke about kids on, on Facebook, of course, the other day. And I said, well, I always told mine that they didn't come with a manual. And then I, as an aside, I said, but it wouldn't have mattered. I wouldn't have read the manual anyway. Um, not necessarily wrong, but when you're under a lot of pressure and things off air and the red lights are lit, knowing that what those lights are is a good first step. And, and Adam, I know that's something that you guys uh, spend a lot of time working with engineering on, on getting that stuff into the books. Yeah, trying to. Uh, I mean, some some of our gear is a little better documented than than other stuff, but you know, having useful information where you can find it is, it's been the goal lately. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, and when, when you're in the moment, you don't want to have to, you know, okay, so I'm on page one of book one. Okay, so that means that I might have an alarm on page nine of book six. So it's trying to get it all into one spot. There's some disagreement sometimes over which spot that information should be in, but um, it's generally all there and you can generally get through it. And yeah, so this yeah. example here kind of shows, you know, what color, and what light um, LED will change. So like we've got an audio, um, you know, left audio low, that's an amber exciter. So network is that, you know, there's, it, it kind of lets you know what you'd expect to see. So if you have like your flashing um, amber for the exciter, like your no network thing, you know, you can get a sense of what you'll visually see um, and you can kind of be like, okay, it's a low, low priority, this or that. Yeah, it is, as a general rule, uh, I've observed that on most pieces of equipment, they follow that same kind of standard color code where green is okay, um, yellow is, hey, you might want to look at this, and red is, uh-oh, something's bad. But uh, that's not necessarily 100% true. I've also seen cases where a green LED is kind of a warning, or you know, a, a red LED is something that may be fairly innocuous, but hey, they put this big obnoxious red LED on there because, well, they didn't have anything else. They <laughs> For some reason, they chose the alarm light to be red, even for minor alarms. So, uh, so yeah, read the manual, yeah. understand what those and, lights. And let's not even get going about blue LEDs. That's a whole <laughs> different. Uh, <laughs> although I think those are almost exclusively power lights. Anyway. Usually, yeah, usually. So, one other thing that we do talk, and it's funny because Adam and I were mentioning, or I was talking earlier. I've been uh, playing around with uh, one of our old Amfets. Uh, recently, so a, a 35 year old 10 kilowatt, um, somebody needed a hand with a frequency change. And uh, yeah, the, the manuals have evolved a lot over the years. Uh, of course, for us old school guys, I mean, I can look at this AMFET book and find anything in that thing in a heartbeat, but it takes me a little longer in the new books. So it, it does kind of help a lot if you, when you have a free moment because of course we're all got so much free time to to learn the structure of a specific manual too if, if you've got the the chance and i mean i get it i mean you know if you've got automation systems and control surfaces and transmitters and stls and computer stuff and network stuff you got eight different manuals or more written by different people it's a challenge 
Well, and uh, and having written manuals as well, um, I will say that they generally fall into one of a couple of different categories. Uh, you'll have manuals that are very much functional. We'll walk you through procedures and how to do things, common issues that you might find. You have other manuals that are nothing but stacks of text about what the controls do, um, not necessarily procedural. So, you know, getting getting to know those manuals is is kind of important. So, right. And, and speak for equipment. Yeah. If, if I could quick, so the since around NV or V for our, for our product, which puts you pretty much turn of the century, give or take, um, we split. So that AMFET book you've got there would have there'd be like a transmitter book, kind of tell you how it works, general block diagram, and then you'd have smaller books for each individual component that would go mm -hmm. into the the deeper. This is how the circuit works, and here's your diagram. Since around 2098, something like that um, is all I can guess from before I was even here, um, they split them kind of into four. So we've got one for strictly how to do stuff and then one for strictly how to fix stuff. So the yeah. one you kind of want to keep handy um, on the site um, or you know on your laptop as a PDF um, is the, the troubleshooting one. So like even though I deal with these things pretty much every day, one of the first things I'll do when someone calls in and says, hey, it's broken, like, all right, what is it? Let's grab the book and then, then in you go. I find personally it's easier to remember where to find something than to remember something. So yeah. if I know where the information is, I don't have to remember it. And it's, it's just way easier that way. That's what I've always said. I don't need to know the answers. I just need to know where to look. Um, Sean Mattingly provides a really good tip here um, about uh, as far as uh, different colors of LEDs. He puts labels on the gear. With, so like a cable modem will have a label that says blue solid is okay, blue flashing is booting. And that's... That's a really good idea. And I mean, that's something we do provide a key in the manual. So you could put a, like a little label on the front of the transmitter that's red is bad, green is good, orange is, uh -huh, you might want to look at this. And I mean, orange could be anything from, well, flashing orange and green on an exciter is lost or usually a network connection. Uh, steady orange could be an audio problem. So, you know, it may not be RF off air, but you could be audio off air and still just be an orange light. So it, it really does depend on the gear. And that's a that's a great tip. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that. Now, so you get out to the site, things are a little sideways, and we've got to figure out what's gone wrong. Um, what, so this is where we start looking at the different tips. And uh, this is one of the things that I use a lot, especially if I've got it to a board and I just, I know it's an exciter, but I don't know where, and I'm in a position where I'm going to have to do a component level repair because I just don't have time to wait for a board or whatever. Um, I beat the drum on my little FLIR thermal imaging camera. I mean, I love this thing probably more than I really should, but uh, it, it's just a great tool for stuff like that. Uh, uh, what kind of Shane? What, what's the uh, probably pick pick your favorite your favoriteest tool ever? I mean, we're we're going to talk about toolkits later, but uh, if you had to pick your favorite troubleshooting tool, what is it? Well, I'll say the thermal images are sure a lot better than burning your finger on something to try to find out what uh, <laughs> what got hot. Uh, but if I were to uh, boy, if I were to pick a favorite tool. Oh man, that's a that's a really tough call. But if you have one, or if you're able to have one, and now they've come down a lot in price, one of the tools that I find myself using constantly at sites is a spec am. Uh, I mean, you can't really know what's going on with the output of that transmitter if you can't see it. And Nautel, of course, is nice enough to include one in their front panel. But sometimes it's nice to get a you know uh, get a check as well of other frequency, other signals that may be on site, uh, you know, interference right. sources, whether or not uh, you know. Maybe something downstream from the filtering or downstream from the output is having an issue. Um, you know, so being able to uh, to actually visualize that um, is really nice. And actually, the one that I use is uh, made by Keysight. It's called a Field Fox, and it has mm -hmm. uh, several different functions built in. It's got the spec in, but it also has what's called a cable and antenna tester. So what that mm -hmm. can do is actually ping the line and do TDR and show you oh, if nice. there's a fault further up the transmitter. You know, further up the line, tell you if there's a fault maybe in your line or in your antenna or if it's just maybe a connector in the shack that's gone bad which you presumably get, you get also ballpark on what that guy would, say get a ballpark on what that would run so base models they usually start i want to say somewhere around seven grand but it depends on the features that you add to them and also andrea tipped me off to this they actually sell them on ebay as factory refurbs 
So mm. um, it's a great place to uh, to look for them. And basically, you just tell them what features you want on it. I mean, if you don't need the network analyzer portion of it, great. If you just need the cable antenna tester, great. Uh, but it is handy to have the spec in in there as well. So that's a Keystone Field Fox. Keysight Field Fox. Yeah. Field formerly Keysight Agilent, Field formerly Fox. HP. Yeah. Oh, really? No kidding. Okay, good to know. Uh, Jeff Wilson from our US, West Coast US sales guy says one of the things he likes about the newer manuals is the hyperlink connectivity. And, and that is something that we are adding in a lot. So if something says you'll find this on this page, usually the page is a hyperlink. Um, that's uh, improved a lot. It didn't used to be like that. Um, Curtis Stefan mentions that having the manuals in PDF and using Control F to uh, find keywords is great. And that is more and more these days. I mean, I've got this old MFAT 10 in paper because I don't have to have a PDF of it, but uh, pretty much everything we build now, I've got the PDF available either on my OneDrive to save my local storage or on a USB. Well, and I know there's a lot of, well, I, I heard a lot of pushback from uh, from engineers about not having paper manuals, about just having uh, electronic manuals. Well, uh, the other thing that we most, you know, that we carry to us that our, uh, to our sites most of the time, at least I would hope, is a laptop um, or, or at least a tablet or something. And uh, the combination of that plus electronic manuals, oh man, it's it's really powerful. Yeah, it's great to have paper manuals should the battery die on your, on your laptop or something, but still, um, as a general rule, you know, that uh, that combination is really, really powerful. Right. Well, and the other thing about laptops is that, I mean, speaking of our gear, anything current has got the, the user interface where you've got a lot more power and flexibility through the user interface than you do through the front panel. Um, you know, and I, I know that's the case for a lot of other gear beyond ours. So definitely a laptop is becoming another one of those required tools. Uh, so Adam, we talked earlier about the, the guys that say, yeah, I'm three hours from the site. I'm not there anymore. Um, and you and I did a session who oh, back June, I think it was about, uh, working with support. And I stole this slide from there cause it kind of bears repeating, but, uh, so, I mean, when you call support, obviously your first question is what the heck am I looking at? Yep. And uh, how do you how do you find that? Um, well, so there's a few ways we can do it. Um, oftentimes people won't know model and serial number as much as they'll know call sign. Um, so in our case management system and all of our tracking here, everything's logged by um, accounts of what company owns it, call sign that it's registered under or was registered under when it sold. Um, some transmitters seem to change hands every other day, um, but then model and, and serial number. So usually we can get it just off the call sign um, and they'll say, you know, it's, uh, I forget what examples I used last time, but you looked them up. So uh, I, I think it's a WABC and WXYZ or something like that, but we, we can mm -hmm. look them up um, and there we can find the, the actual asset. And so some of these transmitter models now have been out long enough that there's been a few revision changes. It's not as bad now as it was for some of the earlier stuff in terms of intercompatibility, um, but knowing that you have, you know, VS300 serial number 85 um, helps us know exactly which boards are in that. So while it's still a VS300, um, the pieces under the hood might be different and might be completely incompatible. So yes, you've got a Chevrolet Impala, but you know, it's a 2020 versus a 65. Um, so, you know, assuming the Impala was out in 65, I think so. But you, you can't just pop the hood and, and swap everything over, so it helps know exactly what we're dealing with. And that's uh, something that goes back all the way. I mean, the ND10, we started building in 1988. We stopped in 99 to 2000, ish, give or take. And yeah. there were two major revisions in between there, plus in the first generation, three different filter compartments. So, you know, it's uh, knowing you've got an ND10 is one thing, but knowing which ND10 lets me know whether you get an NAF49, an NAF55, an NAF62, et cetera. So uh, definitely that's, uh, that's something that is really, really useful. Um, right. and on, on that point too, um, the book that you have for your ND10 circa whenever may not necessarily reflect the actual hardware that you got. So we'll roll mm -hmm. out changes as we go along. And then once we do a full boom, we're into Rev B, we'll redo the book. So you could have a Rev A with a bunch of sort of 
interim parts in there. So we'll get a lot of um, usually email orders um, and just generally from overseas because they don't call in. Um, it, people who are in, you know, this half of the planet, it's, it's easy to call it's the same kind of business hours. And they'll say, you know, I need this part for this transmitter. I'm like, well, actually you don't, um, you know, you need this one. So if, if generally speaking, if you need to get a part, it's easiest to give us the number that's on the one that's broken, um, unless there's just a smoking hole where the part used to be. Uh, but that'll get around any of the inconsistencies in what book you have versus what hardware you have. And it might be that we'll come back and be like, we can't do that one anymore. It's now a modification kit to go here. I know for NV, um, NX, anything with a touchscreen, um, we've gone through three or four different touchscreen models over the years. Um, the single board computers have changed. So, you know, yes, that block in your transmitter is still the same piece, but the what makes it up is different. Um, so mm -hmm. we may not be able to get part A, but we have a kit that'll let you put in part B as the new wiring and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, there's if you can read the part off what you've got that's broken, that's good. Um, but just be aware that what's in the book may not be be gospel. Um, so as much right. as the books are great, um, you know, nothing's 100%. So it's always worth having a call just to be sure. Right. And usually there is a deviation sheet of some sort that, that lets you know these differences, but usually those never get put into the manual. Um, nope. It used to be year, years ago, you know, we ship it out, uh, the transmitter come in and there'd be 20 or 30 pink pages in the front of the book with a note saying, these are the deviations from the standard for your transmitter, put these into the appropriate places in your manual. And yeah, that never, ever happened. Um, Sean makes another good point. Sean Mattingly says that he's uh, put the no his serial numbers for our gear in his phone's contacts. So it uh, makes it easier for him to do a call-in session. And he's really, it, it's right, because if you have the serial number for the equipment, then right off the bat, when you call in, Adam knows exactly what he's looking at, what version of everything. And he doesn't have to play 20 questions to figure out what you're looking at. Right, and uh, it, what's interesting to note is that some equipment actually includes that serial number within its uh, its remote interface. Uh, I'm not sure about the, I don't recall if the Nautel transmitters do or not, but I know a lot of equipment has that information available, uh, whether it's stored on an EEPROM somewhere and just reads it that way or uh, or whatever. Uh, but that's yeah. uh, it's kind of another tip to keep in mind. Yep, no, that's a really good point. And it's one of the things that I've told folks before too, is uh, when you are working with your fancy P-Touch label maker, and, you know, of course, you get a new label maker, you go around, you label everything. Well, in the process of labeling everything, put the serial number for each piece of equipment on a label on the front of that piece of equipment. Because, of course, we always hide serial numbers at the back near the power cord where you can't get to or you can't see. So uh, definitely that's a, that's a good point, too. It's a, a really good tip. Um, I'll give you an, another example. I had a call that actually the guy that called me on this AMFET uh, called about another transmitter and he said, I've got another AMFET 10. And uh, turned out he didn't have an AMFET 10, he had an ND 10, which has an AMFET placard on the front of it. So yeah, definitely knowing the serial number goes a long, long way. Then one other note I've got here, and Adam, you can uh, you can speak to this, but uh, when you call in and leave a voicemail, if for ever, any reason all the techs are busy and you just say, um, yeah, this is so-and-so. If you could give me a holler when you have a moment, that'd be great. Um, and don't tell us that you're off the air. That's not not recommended. No, not not really, no. So that, yeah, having some sense of urgency, some sense of what's going on. Um, and, and even again, you know, I've got this sort of a box for this station. Um, it's doing this, you know, give me a call at this number. When you get a when you get it, I've had a, a bunch of those come in and it's it's easy to deal with them. But the ones are like, hey, you know, give, give me a call. It's like, oh, okay, you know, because if let's say you you put an order and you're waiting for your parts, you want to know what's up with that. I can look into all that before I pick up the phone, figure out what the deal is. Um, or you know, if you've got X Y symptom, I can you know look and see. Okay, these are probable things. We can jump right in, rather than do that big you know 10 minutes of back and forth um, before we even get once we start talking before we can even start doing anything. So yeah, a general rule, you know, when contacting support, email, phone call, whatever it is, the more you can give us, the better. Um, I would much rather have way too much information than not enough because I can ignore all the stuff that doesn't matter, 
but I can't invent from nothing what the actual problem is. So if you tell me 15 things, only one might be what I actually care about, but I have it. Um, and that's, that's the key thing there. Right, yep. absolutely. And uh, I actually had taken a few calls where the person calling didn't leave any contact information. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, they call support, expect you to uh, to know just you know who it is that's calling. And I was fortunately able to at least track it down somewhat through caller ID. I knew you know I was like, oh okay, I'll start by calling back the number that actually called me. And uh, but yeah, again, as much detail as you can possibly give. So many 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 years ago, we got a box in the Bangor office. It had our address written on the front. The FedEx label had been torn off at some point. Um, and we're not sure exactly where, but it did arrive in a FedEx shipment. It was one of our modules in it. No indication at all who it was from, what it was for. That thing sat on the shelf for years before I, th I think ultimately it probably just got recycled. But uh, but yeah, um, let's see. Marco also mentions that if you're running phone home, make sure you put your serial number and call signs in that space. It is an option and, and that's a good point. Uh, Phone home's been off and on. I think that's being revived again, so uh, that'll be definitely a, a good note. Um, Barry did mention or ask about why not putting the serial number on the front panel display, and that's good until you get to a situation where you don't have a front panel display. Um, just this last weekend, I was up at Cove FM, and that's what I was there for, was to replace the front panel display that was no longer lit. So, yeah, it, it's not a bad idea and it, it would help in some points, uh, but it would add some time to the process, both to find it and to install it. So, so there is a, a issue there too. And for our stuff that's more than just one, one box, one board, it becomes tricky in terms of where do you actually store the root? Um, you know, where is that value actually kept? Because if you have a bunch of VS and you want to keep four or five exciter boards as floating spares, well, which one becomes the the master where do you store it because that's that's the brain for that box so if you store your serial number on that then it can shift all over the place if you embed it in the front panel and that goes out then what do you do it's um yes it's it there, there's more to it for for these kind of boxes than just you know stick it in there i guess some of the smaller mm -hmm. stuff like a, a modem or you know there's just there's one board the only thing you would ever change would be that entire unit um it's yeah you can embed it right in there there's, there's no big deal but um, you could if you really wanted. Um, in the AUIs on ours, there's a, a field you can put in call sign. I think it's 20 characters or something. So you could put serial number in that too. So if you're logged in remotely, you've got call sign and serial number, um, you know which one you're dealing with. Mostly yep. useful if you've got a rack of VS or something like that that you're trying to deal with. But stickers yeah, but always no. work too. So. Yeah, and I mean, I've got like uh, Cove, that's uh, one of the things I've that's a good point. We could put CKVE H10, whatever the serial number is. It's low. I remember that much. Um, now, going a step further. So we get there, we got a big box, and there's a red light and maybe a little bit of smoke, and we got to do some troubleshooting. And I put up my usual routine because I'm very much a look for output, check for input, and then pick a point in the middle. Um, and that's how I tend to work everything. And then if I've got a signal in the middle, then I go to the right half. And if I don't have a signal in the middle, I go to the left half, which of course all works out well until it turns out that the reason I don't have any signal is because there was an interlock open. Um, and so I've chased that. Uh, Adam, what do you use for, uh, for techniques in that regard? Anything specific or do you just sort of follow the lights and figure out from there? Um, well, one lesson that kind of Terry told me when I was first starting out is kind of start at the bottom, work your way up. So, you know, AC, DC, drive, um, power, output. So just kind of work your way up. And the first thing that's missing, okay, the problem is going to be somewhere before that. So, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so if you walk in and, you know, everything's completely black, all right, well, it's a reasonable bet that we're way down at the, the bottom stage because you can, you can spend hours and hours. Why do I have no output? Why do I have no output? But if you know there's nothing at all upstream, well then that's that's your reason there. Um, on the phone, I'll usually ask. Um, so most of my time, I'm not actually there to to do the you know the looking and the seeing. So you kind of got to play 2,050 questions with 
with people to figure out what what the situation is. So you know, what is it doing is as useful as what it's not doing sometimes. Um, you know, do I have a display? Let's look there. Let's see our alarms, and it might be okay. I've got a PA fail, so that's that's fine. You know, there's nothing there. Then just you know, go through your layers so you find where you have it stops working and that's a, a good spot to do it, which is effectively what you're doing there, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. you, you find the bounds and then, okay, I'm in the middle of it, so. Good. Yep, okay. exactly. And, and that approach works for pretty much any system, uh, transmitters, audio paths, uh, whatever, just find where the signal stops. Uh, you have the advantage with certain uh, certain failures that uh, it actually gives you a visual indicator of where the smoke got let out. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but even on those, it's important to find out why the smoke got let out, so you don't just replace that part and then suddenly have the smoke let out all over again. Yep, and uh, I, I think that's uh, that's also a big challenge I've run into. And, and talking to to Adams, uh, bottom to top, um, we and then I'm picking the old amphets again. It is possible to have a para amplifier short out such that it won't generate an alarm but it will blow up the modulator, which will then blow up the rectifier regulator, which is at the bottom. So you fix the rectifier regulator, but the modulator is still shorted. So you blow the rectifier regulator up again and you say, aha, I've got to go a step further. Um, it's not the most cost effective, but again, with the older stuff where you've got a little more minimal, uh, I guess, alarm, you've got a couple of red lights on the front you um, you do end up playing trial and error a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, uh, for me, my record is blowing up about $8,000 worth of stuff before I found the root cause. Um, Shane, do you want to talk to that? Oh, oh yeah. I, I think we've all been there at some point or another. Um, but uh, my, my most uh, infamous one was in a... Uh, uh, in a Nautel uh, V-series transmitter, you know how the V5s they have that big power supply bank down in the down the lower uh, right on the front there. Right? Uh, so it kept blowing fuses. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? It kept uh, you know kept fixing things, and then uh, eventually I discovered that uh, that a module somewhere in the you know in the chain actually had a shorted AC input, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, discovered with. Uh... One of our not competitor, I guess, uh, many many years ago when uh, we first um, were, were doing the higher power FM, um, about the time that India started privatizing radio, we sold a bunch of 10 kilowatt FM stations, 10 and 20s, and uh, they wanted one kilowatt backups, and we didn't have a product at the time, so we used Crown Line kilowatts, which are, of course, as you know, Shane, a, a veritable tank. Uh -huh. The challenge was at the time the crown had only been sold in the U.S., and which of course has a split phase 120 volt instead of a pure single phase line neutral 120. And we connected them in India, and they all worked just fine until the first storm and the power got a little sideways, and it blew half the capacitors out of the power supplies. So, uh, yeah, there's yep. definitely some interesting things there. Um, right, and John, that's how really good. Now, yeah. I was just, just briefly, that's another good point. Um, knowing what kind of power supply you have, whether it's a switching power supply, whether it's a linear power supply, because uh, switchers, you could feed them just about anything and they don't really care. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not maybe not as robust sometimes as the linear power supplies, but the linear supplies, if you, uh, if you feed them the wrong voltage or the wrong configuration, things go boom. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're not, I mean, some of them have a really broad band input, but some of them are a lot less tolerant. So, you know, different, what do they say? Your mileage may vary. Um, John Huntley, you'd made a, a good comment here, and, and I'm sensing a story here. Do you have a microphone that uh, we can unmute and uh, have you come online here? I'm just kind of curious to hear, hear what, uh, what prompted this specific uh, comment. Well, actually, it goes back to an MCI tape machine from quite a while back. And I got a call in the middle of the night from a, a producer who said that the machine's not working. And I asked her, is it plugged in? And uh, she would have made a sailor blush. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's, but again, there, that we, we run into some, some people like that along the way. 
Yeah, and I'll give you an example of that. I got a call from a 50 kilowatt AM, and I've used this story fairly recently. I, actually, I, I know Marco's in the audience. He would have heard it the other day uh, when I did a session, a tip session for Wabi. But uh, I, I got a call from a customer in the Caribbean with a 50 kilowatt AM, and they didn't have drive. And I said, RF drive or, or mod drive, PDM? And they said, no. And I said, what do you mean, no? No, neither. I said, okay, something. So those are two totally different circuits coming from totally different sources. They have a common power supply, but oh, they have a common power supply. So we start trouble. Nope, there's no 15 volts. Well, let's go backwards. Do we have AC company? We got no AC company. Turned out that uh, there's a separate 120 volt feed for the exciters. In their case, rather than going through the normal wiring of the transmitter. They just run a uh, extension cord into the back of the control cabinet, and that's how the exciters were plugged in, until somebody unplugged it to vacuum something. So then took the 50 kilowatt totally down. So yep, no, John, I appreciate that. That's a really good point. Uh, anybody else who's got uh, is it plugged in yet? Stories, uh, feel free to uh, hit the hand wavy icon or, uh, or or throw me a comment in the questions because those are some of the best ones. Troubleshooting often comes down to the three rules of rock and roll. Is it plugged in? Is it turned on? Is it turned up? <laughs> I've never heard it put quite like that, but yeah, that's exactly right. Have you ever had a call, Adam? And I know I've had this more than once. Uh, the XL series, if you hit the raise lower power buttons at the same time, which happen to be adjacent to each other, uh, it reset the power to zero. Have you ever had a call from somebody where I can't get any output because they weren't turned up? Uh, yeah, I think I've had that. The J1000s do it. I think XR does it too. There's there was a, anything with a raise lower. I think you hit them both. They they zero out. So yep. what what I've run into a bunch with um, XL, XR, and and Jazz too. Any of the what I call those well, they just the increase decrease transmitters is that they'll have a preset for X kilowatts or X watts, but it's not actually watts. It's voltage output. So when the load swings a little bit. Um, you know, your actual effective power changes. So a lot of people, you know, I'm on my, my 30 kilowatt preset, but I'm putting out 35. I'm like, well, okay, what's what's the load look like or what's what's changed? And it turns out mm -hmm. it's just they retuned something. And I guess now the transmitter sees not what it used to see. So click it down a little bit and there you go. Um, yeah. I ran into that in a, with a box in Indonesia, actually. Uh, the last place I went back in January when travel was a thing. Uh, <laughs> And that there, it was running at one one level, um, got it running, we were at three kilowatts and then went for supper and then they're like, oh, we're down to like 2.8. It's like, okay, well, I guess everything's coming up to temperature and we're settling into what our actual operating and beads is gonna look like. So give it a click, click and there's your there's your three kilowatts. So mm -hmm. um, that, I guess that's another thing that's, it's useful to know kind of broad strokes how, what you're maintaining works. Um, because you know, for those, it's it's click, click, click. There's your power into whatever the load happens to be. Um, all the FM stuff. Um, well, actually, not that's not also not true. So, you know, Q and I think V probably is the same. Where it's it's click, click, click. You're at this many volts, and that's your power. So VS yeah. and onwards, and for the the NX and onwards, it, it's all power. So you tell it do X kilowatts, and the load yeah. can swing as far as it wants, and you'll stay at that wattage output. But everything else is yeah. X volts into whatever the load is. Yeah. Right, and the I was actually going to mention. I was actually going to mention the V series, uh, Jeff, and I think you uh, you actually told a story about this the other day, where um, I had one. Uh, acting really, really squirrely. Um, the power wouldn't stay on. I'd look at the logs and it showed a whole bunch of things being clicked, you know, like the bunch of changes being made. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Well, come to find out one of the front panel little membrane buttons there had gotten diff had uh, gotten a little squirrely. And the fix, poke a tiny little hole in it. Yep. Now the, the key point uh, there is, is poke a little hole. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there been a few the where they off. just kind of just slice, the, yeah. slice no. the buttons right off but yeah no. yeah so laverne Seaman, siemens asked a really good question and i know that uh for the electronically because uh so factory test data when we build the transmitter it goes through some sort of test procedure and there's test results used to be that uh, arrived with the transmitter taped in the inside of one of the blank panels somewhere now it's uh, kept electronically and uh, we mostly just store it at the office 
Um, is there a time limit on that? Do you guys still have the paper files and customer service for the older ones? Um, yeah, there's a couple of filing cabinets over there with work orders and stuff in them. Um, anything that's been scanned, I can get right now. Um, actually, I went to a site locally here that had a Q20 from uh, 99 or 02 or something like that, and I printed off the critical sheet um, before I left. So we've we've got them all. Um, we can email soft copies just to just a phone call and we need of course the model and serial number but yep. you know with with that and little table we can, we can go what you want so and the current electronic stuff we we don't have an expiry date on that i mean it's just all kept forever as far as i know so, um yeah i think I, I think we've got well i mean apart from things that disappeared during the eons um but that as far as i know there's there's never been a set we're going to keep your test data for six months and then sad for you uh, it's you know this filing cabinet was in a room that flooded so uh, that's all we can do but for the most mm -hmm. part we've we've got copies of pretty much everything uh, going right back so very good very good thank you oh one other thing that we talk about a lot and and i mean I, i'm mixed emotions on this one because I'm the factory guy. So, uh, you know, my, my first answer is always going to be, if you got a problem, call the factory, don't whine about it on Facebook. But having said that, Facebook can be a really good resource for stuff like that. So this was one of the, I sort of took a look at the different resources that I use. Uh oh, Adam's moving in to. to yeah. What look at that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I probably shouldn't necessarily have uh, put up my uh, list of bookmarks because goodness knows what all I, I didn't vet the list before I put it up there. So hopefully I was uh, being being good when I was bookmarking stuff. Uh, I do see one from a man's health that's probably not necessarily appropriate to electronics, but anyway, uh, you know there there are a bunch of. Uh, engineering websites on facebook of course there's uh different uh engineering resource websites uh our specialties used to have the great set of uh great set of calculators on the on their site um continental had a, an amazing resource with the e-slide uh, programs um, i don't know if anybody else has got a copy of those i think i still do somewhere uh, SBE, the revamped website, I already plugged that. Um, I, I picked Wisconsin because I'm on the board, full disclosure, but uh, state broadcast associations, a lot of them have uh, resources like that. Uh, so Shane, what do you use for for the, you know, when you don't want to bother the factory, but you need an answer for what may be a niggling little thing? Oh, the the, the social groups on Facebook are, are absolutely awesome for that because, that, I mean, there's, there's so many people from this industry hanging out in one or more of those, it seems. Um, so very rarely do I not get an answer from either, you know, another person, you know, another uh, station who's had that issue or, um, as you know, Jeff, from the manufacturer. <laughs> so. And Adam, I've seen you kicking around on Facebook once or twice here or there, too. Yeah, I tend to watch more than anything else, but uh, it's, it's interesting to see. There's a... I've been to a few of the sites that actually have popped up there, which is kind of funny to, to see them from uh, from this side of the planet when I was there before. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun. Yep. Yep. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's another thing. Now, the big thing, and we're starting to run a little shy on time, but th this is probably the big thing. So, Adam, you've done field service. Shane, you're in and around. Uh, Jerry Olson makes a good point, too, and it's not on my list. Uh, PubTech, the uh, public radio technical list server. Uh, it's pubtech.org. Um, there's a Christian radio technical list server, CR Tech. Uh, I think that's also a .org dom domain still, I believe. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, Barry Mishkin, uh, I think maintains radiolists.net. Uh, I think you can get to those through Barry's, the BDR. Actually, I'll tell you what, I saw him in the audience. If he's here, I'm going to unmute him and give him a little bit of a uh, little bit of mic time for this because it is a good resource. Uh, Barry, 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 um, you are not muted. If you can unmute yourself and uh, we'll... Uh, let you uh, hear a little bit about uh, what you got. Hello, Jeff. How are you? 
I'm well, I'm well. So uh, you do run the BDR and it is the BDR.net, right? Broadcasters desktop resource? W.the, the BDR.net. Correct. Broadcasters desktop resource. And, and you uh, do have the uh, the radio lists uh, forums, correct? The oldest running, uh, pretty much, uh, broadcast, which uh, we've been doing since the mid 80s. Uh, we have, of course, Tech Assist. We have uh, Tech Zone. We have the alternate frequency for broadcasters that want to talk about side things like ham operations or flying drones or whatever. And uh, of course, we also do our Thursday lunch gathering that uh, has a good bunch of folks visiting with us. So another great resource there. Uh, and you can get to all those through the uh, the BDR, right? Yes, indeed. It's, uh, right. again, the, the BDR.net. And the menu, uh, you can look for resources. You can look for uh, uh, under the menu there for uh, the lunch gathering under news. There's all, And I'll answer questions if anybody wants to send me an email. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Barry. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Appreciate it. And one of the other ones that I, I've used a lot, it's called the Virtual Engineer. It's broadcastengineering.info. It's a, a purely 100% dedicated engineering resource. So if you sign up for a membership there, then uh, the, and the biggest challenge, and, and Shane, I'll, I'll get you to address this because I know you're active on almost all the same ones that I am. How do you keep them all straight and still manage to get your actual work done? <laughs> Well, that that is a challenge. The temptation to be constantly uh, constantly checking things throughout the day is uh, is kind of strong. But um, yeah, I I say you know there there are a couple of ways you could either you could approach it. You could either just you know uh, check them once or twice a day and uh, and chime in, um, maybe at the beginning and the end of your day or something. Or uh, as you see things, just you know if you've got a quick response, just uh, respond to it. Uh, I had somebody once tell me that uh, you know. Uh, if it takes, if it'll take you less than five minutes to respond to something, just do it, you know. And I think that applies to yeah. these groups as well. So if you've got mm -hmm. an answer for something, it'll take you less than five minutes or so to write and respond to. Then you know, just go ahead. Yeah, and Barry made a point with his too. One thing he missed: they uh, they use uh, names and professional attitudes, so they try to avoid the flame wars. And and that is one advantage of the uh, dedicated technical forums, like like the virtual engineer or the radio lists over some of the Facebook ones, which can get a little more of a free for all on occasion. Yeah, social media can go down some rabbit trails sometimes. It can. Now, that's all great for the virtual world, but ultimately when we get to the site and we've got to replace this display or we've got to figure out what this amplifier is, at that point, we need to pick up the tool bag. And uh, you'll notice I've got my handy dandy uh, not tell tool bag there. Um, these compliments of the Association of Public Radio Engineers. So there's a there's a little plug to uh, to Rich and, and the folks at the APRE. Um, but uh, what are your must-have tools for your toolkit? So so one that I've been using a lot. Um, actually, it's something something really simple, and I think everybody should have one or something like it. Uh, Klein makes a really slick 11-in-one screwdriver. If there's one thing I can take to a site, it's that. It has, I mean, it's all the screw, all the screwdriver bits. Uh, it even has some nut drivers if you just take the screwdrivers out of those little, uh, you know, out of there all holding. And uh, yeah, so that mm -hmm. that comes in really handy. Um, another thing uh, must have is is a good flashlight um, out at the site. Um, now so I found may... this up, and uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, no, Adam will get a kick out of this because of. Uh, the where it came from. I don't know if it's going to be able to focus. It's a Sonifex uh, flashlight. Yeah, I, I grabbed a fistful of those when I was there last year. <laughs> and year it before. is the yeah. coolest little, a little battery powered with a magnet on it, but it is the brightest little thing. Yeah, so those are those are really really handy to have. Um, uh, multimeter can be uh, can be something that's uh, really helpful to have. Do you have voltage <laughs> where you're uh, mm -hmm. where you're expecting it? Um, but so I'll, uh, I'll yeah, throw out my list too while yep, we're at it. Go. So now one other thing, and I just ran into these when I was, uh, Jamie, the other engineer for Cove FM uh, had 
one one of these it's it's a usb chargeable work light led work light and wow is it bright and 30 bucks on amazon for a pair of them i, I looked them up just uh just before well to scavenge that picture so um and i forget there's sun sun something sun glow sunlight something but uh yeah, that's uh, cool. Um, John Van Milligan makes a really good point. And uh, John, I'm going to open up your microphone too, because I know you've uh, got uh, a fair bit of background in uh, in getting to, and, and some of your sites are, well, a little less than uh, hospitable, if we uh, put it gently. Let me see if I can, uh, maybe I'll, uh, there we go. Um, so uh, okay. John, you, you mentioned having a RJ45 crimper. Yeah, um, working with a lot of Axia stuff, everything is RJ45, but I've run into cases where that little plastic clip thing gets broken mm -hmm. off and the connector falls out. I got one night right now on my switch by my computer here. I bumped it out earlier, so I'm going to go grab my tool bag. It's the same one you have, Jeff, um, and get my crimper and... Um, connectors and replace it because it just fell out and i mean there's times where that just comes in so handy mm -hmm. yeah and that's one of the things that i shane you'd mentioned it before where one of the critical things is a laptop anymore yep. and laptop without an rj45 cable is uh you know or cat 6 cable cat 5 cable whichever is absolutely well, and that brings up another good point. If you still have some equipment that uses serial ports or uses some kind of weird proprietary connector, um, make sure you have those cables with you as well. Yeah. So Adam, was it because yeah, you do the overseas stuff? So when you jump in the uh, jump in the car to head to the airport, you're not going to be running back to grab the screwdriver you forgot, and you may not be able to find it there. What uh, what are what are your must-haves? Is there anything critical there? Um, so you've got most of them covered off here. So you have fillets and flats, your all your necessary sizes. A knife is an incredibly handy thing to, to have on hand for any number of things you want to do. You can strip wire with it, cut cable ties, um, cut off a sandwich, do all sorts of stuff. Um, nice set of little needle nose pliers, definitely don't go stray. Good sharp cutters um, are handy. Um, so you mentioned having all the, the connectors and adapters you need. I was in um, the Maldives before Christmas last year for a, a 25 kilowatt main standby, and I had to serial into one of the units, and we ended up having to go to, I didn't have a, the right cable with me. Um, so we had to go to a, just a, a general supply, like electronic supply store, and I ended up making an adapter that was probably about this long. I think I went DB25 to DB9 to a, a changer, back to 25, then back to, to nine again, just to, to get the orientation the way I needed it. So it's, yeah, having the right adapter is, is definitely handy. Um, most of my stuff tends to be, um, you know, set acceptance and commissioning, but the times I'll go for a repair, it's, it's good to get as much information as possible um, from the end user before you're on an airplane for what's going on, what am I gonna do, be doing, what do I actually need to work on? So. Um, Indonesia this year, that was an XR. You can fix one of those with a screwdriver and an oscilloscope. Um, so that's all I took. Um, but for some other stuff, there was, I was in Oman, there was an NV40 that took a, a big face full of lightning, fried the reflected power probe on it, um, blew a reject load up. So for that, I needed to take um, a power meter um, so we could actually make sure we had calibrated for reflected power. Um, but my, my general go bag is pretty much all the things you've got listed here. Um, that multimeter is a lifesaver. Um, and it's worth even just spending the 40 bucks on one on Amazon and just leaving it at the site. Because I've had calls. There was one that I remember. I, I forget where it was. Um, I think it was an after hours call. And it started, it was the station owner who, I guess, had the most vested interest in this thing being on air. And we got to the point of, all right, well, let's see what the AC looks like. It's like, oh, I don't I don't have a meter, don't know how to do that. And that's fair enough. Um, his chief engineer was there, um, had the, the know-how, just didn't have a multimeter, no meter to test it. Then there was a contract engineer on site who also didn't have a multimeter. So it's, you know, station owner, I can understand, chief engineer, oh, but, you know, the guy who's charging by the hour to, to be there, 
you should mm-hmm. have a, a reasonable go bag. Like, um, and most of the the basic stuff for for our gear for troubleshooting your your average stuff, this list will get you through. Um, yeah. You know, we're we're not requiring you know the fifty thousand dollar analyzer, um, you know, oscilloscopes and, and any of this stuff. Just the the basics here to be able to take it apart, um, check a couple of things in it, and throw it back together. Uh, yep. Electrical tape. I absolutely love electrical tape. Um, I'll use it for for labeling wires um, to keep track of how things came apart, for holding leads up in places. Um, yeah, that's when I go. I'll always grab. We have document size Ziploc bags, so I'll put my travel itinerary and receipts in that, and then I'll grab a roll of electrical mm-hmm. tape. And that's that's always my my shopping list at stores. But this this is this is pretty much the list with the addition of cables and adapters um, that you might need, serial to yeah. USB, um, things like that. Right. Uh, John Huntley made a, a note. He caught on my uh, slide, and I'm just going to click back to it real quick, of the uh, toolkit. Uh, he, he caught my non-contact voltmeter hanging off the right-hand side and, and said, yeah, that's an excellent tool. Um, BGS was giving those away at uh, NAB a few years ago, and I kind of cabbaged onto one, and then I've got an Innovonics uh, multi-tool over on the left, or multiple screwdriver, rather. Um, Randy Kababwe, Randy's got a, got a hand raised here. Randy, I've got you unmuted. If you want to unmute yourself, um, let us know uh, what's on your mind, because uh, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff come in for questions here, too, so I'll uh, I'll uh, hit those. Oh, and I'm told uh, we gave uh, the non-contact voltmeters away as well last NAB. Um, from from Ed, uh, I didn't uh, get one of those. Yeah, Ed, what's up with that? Where's mine? <laughs> We're gonna have a conversation. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> just don't get. Oh, there you go. Randy just uh, mentioned that uh, zipper mic bags are great for carrying small tools, and that's another really good point. Like, if you looked inside of my toolbox, I've got uh, a bag full of screwdrivers. I've got another bag full of wrenches. Um, it, it's just easier to find them if you've got them a little organized. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a set of those as well. They're uh, actually, uh, again, I, I like fine tools just because they're fairly durable, but uh, same thing, the little bags that I kind of comp- compartmentalize things into in my larger toolbox. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see, Curtis mentions that uh, some rechargeable lights will work off a phone backup charger if they can connect with USB. Uh, these floodlights, for example, will work off USB if they uh, if the internal battery dies. Uh, William Harrison mentions that uh, there's a website, uh, rjclip.com, uh, radio james clip clip dot com, that uh, where you can fix the locking tab on an existing RJ45 connector. Uh, Mark Boris mentions the multi tool, Leatherman Gerber, pick your. So Leatherman Gerber is like Chevy Ford. Um, you know, everybody's got their favorite, but uh, definitely there are. Uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, options there. Um, Duncan Fowler mentions the uh, a magnetic hanger for a multimeter and provides a link to Amazon.com. Uh, uh, I think if you, let's see, Googled, it says multimeter hanging, universal, practical, strong. So uh, those, are, those are the keywords that you could search. But uh, multimeter hanger, now here's a challenge. What happens if you've got an aluminum rack? But there, you'll still find a piece of steel in there somewhere. Um, let's see. Fluke 73 replaced the Simpson 260. There's a heretic for you. But he works for us, so I guess we've got to be nice. Um, Jerry also makes a good point. Uh, screwdriver that holds the screw as opposed to magnetic ones, you know, the ones with the little clips that come out. Um, th- those are a good point, especially if you're working on circuit boards where you've got the small, small things. Um, Electrical tape works for that too. Electrical tape will hold your uh, multimeter to the side of an aluminum box as well. There you go. No, it's a little more gentle tape. than duct tape, but oh, uh, there. See, so shot me around right there. I always have a roll of duct tape. Um, let's see. Okay, there. Mark Wachowski tells me that the work light I've got pictured is a Sun Zone IP55. For what it's worth, anybody who's interested in that work light. So if you uh, go to Amazon and look for Sun Zone, you'll uh, to see those work lights. And I can tell you from experience, those things are a beast when it comes to, and and they're good for, they hold a charge for like at, uh, in the bright setting, they're well over an hour worth of usable light. So, so, 
Somebody brought up a great point about uh, these devices being able to be powered from uh, from a USB battery bank. That's another great thing to have in your in your go bag is a good sized USB power bank because you know mm -hmm. inevitably your phone is going to go dead at the worst possible time. But those things, those battery banks, in my experience, will hold a charge forever whether they're used or not. They'll just sit there and you know ready yeah. to go. So. I mean, it is a good idea. I can tell you from just checking the other day the uh, Mophie in my laptop bag, which hasn't been moved since uh, March. Uh, it's the same as Adam, back when travel used to be a thing. Uh, I came back from Lansing, Michigan on March 4th, haven't been anywhere since, and I had the occasion to uh, dig into the laptop bag on the weekend, and my Mophie is dead. So it, it uh, I don't know how long it lasted, but, uh, but not nine months. Um, let's see, there's another good comment from Aaron. Don't forget to keep a power supply for your laptop in your laptop bag or have extras in your sites. And that is yeah, something that. that, sorry, go. I did that. <laughs> yeah. I landed in the destination airport. I was like, oh yeah, I need one of those. Luckily, yeah. I think I was in California, so I was able to buy one, but it could have been bad. Well, especially if you're going overseas, a lot of the overseas airports will make you fire up that laptop to prove that it's actually a laptop and not something disguised as a laptop. And uh, if you don't have uh, any juice in it and no charger, that can be an issue. Um, Anchor Core or Anchor Power Core series of power yeah. banks are pretty reliable. That's Shank that's one of the ones that I use actually, and uh, those are the ones that I say where I'll leave them open, have it charged up, and I'll go back months and months later, having never touched it, and the charge hasn't moved. It's still <laughs> exact. I don't know what kind of magic they've got in there, but it seems to be pretty good about keeping the charge. Okay, I'll have to Google those. Uh, Rodine Renner wants to know what's alignment and what's it used for. So alignment is actually lineman pliers. Um, they're the uh, square nose. They're great for, they, they've got a pair of cutters on the side for cutting heavier cable, but where they're great is if you've got to grab something and hold it securely. Um, needle nose, of course, because they've got the long noses tend to be less less of a grip to them. And the lineman, lineman pliers, you can uh, get in there pretty well. Uh, like vice grips without the, uh, without the locking mechanism. So I, I, they also make great heat sinks if you need to uh, hold something to weld and uh, make it impossible to solder. But uh, that's a whole different con or story. All right, uh, we are well past the top of the hour. Um, so ARCA online information again, this will be archived. Uh, the Waves newsletter just had a new one come out with a tips article. Um, Already found a winner for our disembodied voice, uh, several winners. Uh, Jeff Wilson doesn't qualify because he's uh, an employee. I don't think I put that uh, caveat in there, but no, he's not allowed to play. So uh, Curtis, Steph <laughs> Curtis Stefan is our, uh, our winner for this one. Um, thanks very much for that. But yeah, that is Doc from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I made the joke that I was going to put Dopey in, and Ed said that it'd be too easy to guess. I'm not sure whether he was making a parallel to himself or just that Dopey himself is so recognizable. Um, I actually just wanted to uh, use the least known of all the seven dwarves, so I went with Doc because um, he's the least popular in our house. There you go. See, now Doc, Doc has always been, he's the one that would be an engineer if there uh, was any engineering in Dwarf Village. So on that note, folks, we are hitting pretty close to 10 minutes past the top of the hour. I want to thank you all for being with us today. Adam and Shane, I want to thank you guys especially because uh, definitely it's been it's been a whole lot of fun. Thanks, Jeff. Happy to do it. So on that note, folks, we thank you very much. And we should, uh, let's see, uh, Jeff Wilson's making a crack about how short it is. So uh, it's not really all that short. But anyway. Um, we will see you all <laughs> next week and uh, have a good week, folks.